first you have to tell what the date is. Right. Uncle Milt came over to visit me today. Today is August. Well, you can talk. August, uh, I can't see. <laughs> August the 19th. August the 19th. August the 19th, 1998. Right after Bill Clinton got caught with Monica Walensky, to put in a political perspective for you. And Uncle Milt's over here, and he brought me over some pictures of uh, Claire and his family, and I'm going to scan them, and I'm making a CD-ROM with all the pictures, so he brought them over. And while he was here, he is kind enough to give me some of the family history for all of you listening to this in the year 2197. <laughs> Here's Uncle Milt. My name is Milton Abrams, and I'm going to try to give you a uh, history of the, my family. Uh, I'll start with my grandmother on my father's side. Her name was Naomi Abramovitz. She was married twice. The first husband's name, as far as we know, as far as I can re recollect what was told to me, his name was, his name was either, I think it was William, and the last name was Abramovitz. It was spelled A-B-R-A-M-O V-I-T-Z. She was 16 years old when she married him, and she had one child whose name was Adolf. Her husband was killed by the gypsies, somehow or other, as was told to me. Uh, they were trying to rob him, and uh, he lived on a very small farm. They were trying to rob him. And uh, he got into a fight with a couple of them, and one threw a spade right through him and killed him. She then, two, a year later or so, married uh, my, my uh, biological grandfather, whose name was either Lewis Michael or Michael Lewis. We're not sure. His last name was Shalupsky. It was spelled S H. A L U P S K I S K Y, I believe it would be spelled. I can't be sure of this because there is no written uh, uh, record of, of his name or or how it was spelled. He died, leaving her with six more children. Uh, that made seven all together. She was then about 36 years old. She married him when she was 18, I believe, and, so, and, he, and she was 36 when he died. In chronological names, uh, in order of, of age would be the first, her first child, of course, would be for her first husband, whose name was Adolf. The next one was Harry. The next one was Shana, a woman. Uh, the next one would be uh, Max, then Fanny, then Henry, and there were an, another one or two children, I'm not sure, who had died as infants. Her husband, uh, Michael, or Lewis, was a very, very sick, frail man due to as an asthmatic condition. And uh, as far as I can re recall, he was a, a teaching rabbi. In other words, he would prepare boys for their bar mitzvahs and so forth and taught them to, to read uh, Hebrew. My father told me that he was just a, maybe seven years old when his father died. And he remembers they slept in bunks similar to uh, army bunks, three high or and so, and uh, looked more like shelves than what my father described. And he remembers his father sitting up in bed, looking at the family. He was dying, and he said, "Oi!" After looking at the children, lay down and die. <laughs> when he looked at the children well, and died. Him, he knew he was dying. <clears throat> he knew he was dying. And he looked at the children. Why means woe. 
Yeah. You know, like, woe is me. And, uh, and it was very sad because there was no, there was no mother's assistance or welfare or anybody to help. Now, let me go back a little further than that. Let me go back to Naomi's history. Naomi came, from, from, as, as it was told to me, Naomi came from a family of uh, a mother and a father and, and 11 children. So there were 13 in the family. The uh, Northern Pogroms, it was uh, common for the Tsar to order the Cossacks to go into the town and kill Jews. And they did it with, uh, with relish. They were happy to do it. They, the Jews were persecuted in a terrible, terrible way at that time. Well, that one night they rode into town and somehow or other Naomi's family was picked on along with some others perhaps. They killed the mother, the father, and all the kids, and Naomi was the youngest. She was an infant. They just picked her up and threw her out into the mud street. And uh, after the Cossacks left, and, and people, everybody tried to run out of town, and after the Cossacks left, the people came down and back to town, and, and they found, heard a baby crying. They looked out in the mud, and they found her. And she was raised by uh, another family, we don't know who. We don't know what her last name was, or any of her mother or father's, or, or sibling's names. Anyhow, we go back now. After, uh, after Michael died, she said to her kids, everybody's got to help. She had just given birth to uh, Henry, who was the youngest, and and uh, she found that she could wet nurse somebody else's child because she still had a lot of milk and, the, and the, anybody who was unable to breastfeed their child would hire a wet nurse. But <clears throat> she had a lie in saying that her baby died and she had enough milk for, for some, somebody else, somebody else's child and she hired out as a wet nurse and, and of course was able to somehow to save another um, enough milk to, to keep her child alive. And she said to my father, who was seven years old at the time, everybody's got to earn, a, earn some money. And uh, he, she suggested to him that he go out and pick up twigs in the woods. They weren't allowed to cut, Jews were not allowed to cut down trees. Uh, they could only use, for firewood, they could only use the twigs that lay on the ground. So one day he went out and he gathered a big uh, a bundle of firewood, twigs for firewood, to start fires with. And after he gathered this big bundle, he knocked on some people's doors who were not Jewish because uh, the Jews would, would go out and pick all the small start, uh, twigs they, they wanted, but the Gentiles would chop down trees but they didn't have the starting starting wood. So he knocked on this woman's door, and she, and she came to the door, and she said uh, in, in Russian, what do you want, you little Jew? Of course, all the Jewish children at that time, they wore the uh, sideburns, the you know, curls and the sideburns, and, the, and their dress was different than the other children, and that's how she knew he was a Jew. And he said he wanted to sell the bundle of twigs and she said, how much? And he told her the equivalent, what, what, the way he told me, would be a quarter. No, nah, that's too much money. I don't want it. So he said, lady, it took me all day to build, a, to, to gather the bunch of twigs. It's surely worth a quarter to you. She said, all right. She said, there's a hole in the back of the house. Throw it down there, which he did. He came back to the front door again, knocked on the door, and she said, now what do you want? He said, I put the twigs back in the hole like you told me to. And she said, I don't want them now. Go get them. Take them out. He went to take them out. He found out there was water down in the hole. And of course, nobody would want wet twigs for starting a fire. And he took them back there. And he said, lady, there's water down there. She said, they're wet. She's good for you, little shit. <laughs> and of course, that, that was just one incident of the persecution that the Jews went through. And as we go on, Everybody apparently did whatever they could to uh, earn a few shekels, as they called them in those days, a few pennies. 
and uh, managed to survive. I know that my grandmother, in addition to wet nursing her baby, would do uh, uh, what they call uh, taking care of the dead. If somebody died in the town, Jews we're talking about, if a Jew died uh, today, he would be buried uh, the next day, unless, of course, it fell out on the Sabbath, which was Friday evening. He would not be buried until Sunday. The Sabbath lasts from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. Now, in case anybody wants to do any history to find out about them, they, if they could ever find out about them, it, they were, as far back as you can remember, the family was from White Russia? Yes, they were, they were from White Russia. Where they, they, they call it Belarusia, which means White Russia. In a, in a little town uh, called Machik, a very small town, if anybody knows the, the story of uh, Fiddler on the Roof, that would be an example of what size the town was and how life was carried on there. Uh, so as far I, back as you can remember, I, that's where they I, were I don't know if the town still exists or not. It was very small. And of course, uh, during World War II, uh, when the, Russians, when the uh, Germans went through Poland and Russia, any little town, uh, they just slaughtered the people, whether they be Jews or Poles or whatever, and destroyed whole towns, burned it to the ground, killed off all the population. So there's probably no records anyway. There's, there's very, there's no, as far as I know, there's no records. Nobody in the family ever went back to Russia to find graves or histories or any, any kind of uh, written documents as to the existence of the family. Well, anyhow, as time went on, everybody uh, did what they could to earn a little bit of money. And my father was, I, at this time, as he told me, he was 10 or 11 years old. And he took a job with a peddler that would go from small town to small town to sell whatever wares he had. And he, of course, he drove horse and wagon. And my father's job was to assist him any way they could. Now, when he would stop at an inn for the night, he would put the horse in the barn the wagon would stay outside, and it was covered with a, uh, a canvas. Of course, in the wintertime, the snow, it snowed uh, to maybe a couple of feet. And uh, he would go in and bed, down, bed himself down for the night, and my father would be under the tarpaulin guarding the goods that were on the wagon. And, uh, he, of course, he brought some food out for my father to eat, and my father spent the night uh, huddled uh, in the, into the goods to keep warm with a tarpaulin or canvas over them. In the morning, there might have been a foot or two of snow on top of that, and the man would come out and brush the snow off and let my father out. It was tough, very, very tough living in those days. Later on, when he became 14 or 15 years old, he ran away with the gypsies. Why he ran away with the gypsies, I don't know, but he, he, he wound up living with them for a couple of years. And he learned to speak the gypsy language, which he retained. He, he, he remembered the language until uh, the day he died. And I remember when my father had a furniture store in East Liberty, and the gypsies would come to town, and he would be the first one they would seek out just to, just to talk to him. Mm. And uh, there were a few words that I remember, I, I don't want to repeat now, but most of them were uh, cuss words and, 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 and uh, greeting words and so forth. Oh, yeah. okay. Now I will, I, according to Freddie, it was all right to tell you the story, but anyhow, when the gypsies would come to town, my father was the first one, like I told you, the first one they'd seek out, and uh, the greeting was uh, Kaijala, which meant, how are you, and Chaya means good or something like that. Now the gypsies, would, there was a, a restaurant called the Mayflower Restaurant, which was next door to my dad's store, and they would often go up there to eat lunch or dinner and so forth. And, one day I walked in with my father and he greeted them with uh, Kaijala and Kare and so forth. And then he said, so, so he said to the, uh, the head man, you know, the, the head of the, uh, the group, so Chala, what are you eating? And he responded, Chala means Belinsa. And they all laughed like hell. And I said to my father, we walked away and I said to my father, what did he say? He said, I said, I said to him, what are you eating? And he says, I'm eating pussy and it's good. <laughs> and, 
to me that was that was absolutely nuts. But that's that's the way they talked. You couldn't believe because they said in front of all the kids. Yeah, right? they said in front of all the kids, and of course the kids laughed and everything. But anyhow, tell, tell the other story. One day you're in the store, and some people came. Oh yeah, came years in. years later, after my father had passed away, uh, a gypsy couple walked in with a little boy, and I recognized them as being gypsies by their the way they spoke English and also by the way they dressed it. And uh, while waiting on them, I told them about my father that that he. Uh, ran away with the gypsies uh, when he was young and learned to speak the language and he, and he spoke it pretty well because every time they come to town they'd, they'd look my father up. And I said there was one word that my father said when he would see something, a person or something ugly, he would he would say, it's a lupa. And I never knew what, what he meant. So I said to this woman, I told my, I said to this woman, uh, my father used the word I said to him, where, where are you from? And she said, uh, Russia. And I said, my dad, my dad came from Russia, and he spoke uh, Russian gypsy dialect. But he used one word named, uh, called Zalupa, and I, don't know, I never knew what that word meant. And she looked at her husband, and she says, Zalupa, Zalupa, oh, Zalufa. And they broke out into a, a really a crazy laugh. Even the little boy did. And I said, well, what does it mean? She said, if you if you find a female horse and you lift up the tail, you know what's under there, and it, it's covered with hair and it's ugly, and that's what they call Zalufa, La Zalufa. <laughs> and of course, they broke out laughter again, and I think that was hilarious. <laughs> now, getting back to the, the, the history of the family, um, when my dad was, uh, when my dad was, oh, I, I told him about the, you remember the You ran away with the gypsies. ran away with the gypsies, okay. And when he was, I don't know where he was at the time, but war with the Russia and Japan broke out. And uh, they were, they were uh, conscripting the, the boys who were 18 or older. Well, in the meantime, uh, Adolf had, had moved to America with his family, which whatever family he had at the time. And uh, Harry became the breadwinner of the family, and he was 18 years old, and they were going to take him to the army. And my father heard of it, and went back home, and he told him that he was 18 and that Harry was only 16. Well, of course, they didn't care as long as they had somebody in the family. And so my father, when he was 60 years old, was in, conscripted into the Russian army to go to Siberia and fight the Japanese. No, wait, they would only take one kid. You mean? Well, uh, they they. They knew that 16 was too young, but they didn't. Oh, I see. So, so we, to replace his, his brother, he said he was he 18. Went. So anyhow, he went over to Siberia, and uh, he told me uh, that what they ate and so forth. They would give him a, 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 a can of, of uh, sauerkraut and a piece of dark, very dark, heavy black bread. When you could see the husks inside the bread, it was like, like, almost, uh, like, like uh, heavy, like toast, you know. And, uh, mm. and he said, uh, when you go into the barracks at night, and of course everybody was eating sauerkraut and bread, it uh, didn't smell too good. Oh God! It was crowded in like, 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 like sardines. Like, like sardines, yes. Anyhow, they they made their way to Siberia and they engaged. My father had. He had burlap sacks instead of boots around his feet, uh, very poorly equipped, and they gave him a sickle to fight with. They, had no, they didn't have enough guns. And uh, the, the Japanese beat the Russians so bad, when they would take a prisoner or, or kill somebody, they would cut their heads off, and they literally made a mountain of Russian skulls. And my father told me this, and years later I saw an article there was a, a man by the name of Ripley. He wrote uh, uh, articles and, and, and pictures and so forth in the papers called Believe It or Not. And then one day he showed a, a mountain of skulls and that and it verified what my father said. Anyhow, okay. I mean, the reason we were so bad that my, uh, <coughs> that my father's commanding officer said to the troops, uh, retreat. And my father retreated from Siberia to Philadelphia. <laughs> Long, <laughs> longest retreat in history. 
Now, what happened was uh, he retreated back to his hometown, and he found out from the people that, that Adolf had sent for the rest of the family, and sent them and brought them over to America. And they, and they said, but they left passage for, for Max, my father, uh, to go to America, but he had to go to Bremenhaven, Germany, to catch the, get the ship, and uh, no money for transportation for that, so he had to work his way over to Bremenhaven, how he got through the borders and so forth, I have no idea, but anyhow, he made it to, and they, and, and they went to Philadelphia, the ship docked in Philadelphia, and all my father had was an address <coughs> with where, where, who to contact and what, where the family would be. Well, he spoke no English whatsoever, and uh, when he got off the ship, he had this little slip of paper, and he saw uh, a, a pious Jew that was in with a garb, with the you know the dark clothes and the in the in the sideburns and the beard and so forth. And he walked over and he said to him in Yiddish, uh, "Uncle, Fetter, do uh, who, who this is? My my Jewish not too good." And uh, he looked at the slip of paper. He says, yeah, come with me, I live next door. Oh, my God. And that was, that was quite a coincidence. And then uh, he was reunited with his family. Oh, that must have been amazing. After that, I don't know what sequence it was, but uh, I know that his eldest brother, whose name was Adolf Abramovitz, was in partners with another man uh, in a mattress manufacturing business on the corner of Center and Arthur Street. That was in the Hill District. And I think my father came to work for him uh, another little story, side story. There was another man by the name of Dave Peransky who was also working for my uncle and his partner. And uh, something happened that day that uh, Mr. Peransky was sick and he went to the bathroom too often to suit this other man whose name was, uh, wait, wait, I think a minute, uh, God, it doesn't matter, but anyhow, my uncle's partner said to him, did you come here to work or go to the bathroom? And, and Mr. Peransky got so mad he walked out, and my dad walked out too. So Mr. Peransky went to making mattresses himself, wound up with one of the biggest distributors of a sort of mattress in the country. And uh, coincidentally, his grandson just sold it. That had to be back before World War I. And, um, and, and about two years ago, which was about, two, about three years ago, uh, 19, say, 1995, someplace around there. Uh, his grandson sold it for millions of dollars. Okay, so anyhow, my father somehow wound up in Cincinnati, Ohio, working for a shot manufacturing company who made bed springs, cots, and later on got into the uh, summer furniture business, making chairs and, and, and settees. And at that time, there was a big flood in Dayton, which wasn't far from Cincinnati. And uh, they were making cots, and they were working like double, triple shifts sometimes. And uh, that, that, that shot family happened to later in years on the uh, Cincinnati Reds. My father married a woman down, a woman down there, and her name was Leah Instead. And and they were married in Cincinnati, but somehow they wound up in Pittsburgh, I don't know how many years later. And, it, and right after World War I, there was a bad flu epidemic. There was hardly a family in, in the country that didn't lose a, one, of the, one, one of the members of the family. And one day, well, she had two little girls and a little boy. The, the oldest girl's name was Dorothy, the second one was B, and the youngest son, who was just an infant, his name was Lewis. They both caught the flu and both died within hours of each other, leaving my father with two little kids, and I think at that time they were four and two. Then my father met my mother when the girls were five and three, and they married. My mother at that time, I think, was 21 years old. And uh, 20, 21, she had her first child a year later, who was my brother, Jerry. His name was Jerome. And then me, who was, I was born 16 months after Jerry, and, I, and she was 25 when I was born. And then she had Hilda, who was 18 months younger than me. So by the time she was 26 years old, she had five kids to raise. Oh my gosh. Well, 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 Did he bring his wife with him? 
I mean, his kids with him? We he brought Dorothy and be with him? Oh, sure, sure. My so, when, so she took them in? She took them, she took them in. She became their mother. When they were kids, you know. They did. So they, one time she had six kids. She mother. had five kids there. Not only did she have five kids, but during the same epidemic, my father's, one of my father's sisters died and left three kids, and the youngest one was, was, was uh, born retarded, and he died shortly after, I mean, she died shortly after he was born, and my grandmother raised those three kids, and they would be at our house, like, uh, often for dinner, and when my mother cooked, she cooked like, looked like a rooming house full of people. And, um, so anyhow, uh, we moved, we, I was, my brother and I were born on Bedford Avenue. Give me your dates, too. And my brother was born in 1921, I was born in 22, and Hilda was born in 23. Uh, and, uh, let me see. How about your birthday? Yeah, I think, I, Hilda, uh, my birthday was, my brother's birthday was, was March the 20, 25th. Hilda's birthday was February the 20th, mine was July the 13th. So we were very, very close in age, and, and of course my two older sisters looked after us. And Dorothy was nine years older than me, and B was seven years older than me. Uh, my father opened up a furniture store on Fifth Avenue, which is which it's called Uptown today, Uptown. And he had a second-hand store. And we had a, an apartment above it where we were all, uh, I think Hilda was born there. And then when I was about three years old, four years old perhaps, maybe 1925, 26, 27, we moved to Broad Street in East Liberty, right near the number three police station, is it? Mm -hmm. Number three police station. And from Broad Street we moved to Stanton Avenue, from Stanton Avenue to Chillet Street, from Chillet Street to Hayes, no, from Chilla Street to Baywood Street, from Baywood Street to Highview Street, and from Highview to Hayes, and finally we wound up on St. Marie Street, which is close to Highland Park. And uh, during that period, my sister B had gotten married and moved to Cincinnati. She later returned. Um, and we stayed, we stayed there until my father passed away I was married in October of 1946, and uh, me and Phil, my wife, moved in with my parents. My father and mother insisted that Ann Phil and I live at home with them. And uh, Ann Phil became pregnant three months after we were married, so she was married six months. When July came, my father died at the end of July, July the 30th, 1947. What did he die from? He had a heart attack, and uh, he had a heart attack at work. I had just left him. I told him that this was the last day for the truck inspection. I was taking this truck up, up to the garage, which was around the corner from St. Marie Street where we lived, and it was only like a 10-minute ride from the store, from where my father's store was, to the garage, and as I was backing into the garage, I saw my mother and, and my wife running down the street. And they said, go back to the store, Dad's sick. I said, I just left him 10 minutes ago. They said, please go back as fast as you can. So I took the truck, drove back to the store, and I saw my brother Jerry and uh, my sister be in the car with my father. And I parked the truck and jumped in the car, and I said, take him to the Pittsburgh hospital, which was the closest hospital. And my dad said, no, 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 I want to go home. In the meantime, he was sweating. And it was, Shoulder, his left arm was hurting. Anyhow, I said to my brother while we were driving toward the house, I said, you go straight to the straight to the doctor's office. Don't wait for him to get in his car. B, you go ahead of me and call the doctor and get him ready, and I'll take Dad into the house. Within a very short time, the doctor appeared. My dad was laying in bed, complaining of pains in his chest and pains in his arm. Of course, we were all gathered around him, and he was sweat was just dripping off of him. And this goofy doctor walked in, looked at my father, and said to my mother, he has a ruptured ulcer. My, my mother said, doctor, she said, he never had an ulcer in his life. He's having a heart attack. The doctor said, don't tell me. I'm the doctor. So we, they called for an ambulance, and my brother and I jumped in the ambulance with my father. 
and we went to the Montefiore Hospital, and uh, and they took him into the emergency room, and according to, and the, the resident was there, a resident doctor, and according to my father was sitting, uh, they put, we put him in the room, and, and according to what the doctor had told the, the hospital to watch out for him coming, they told him that, that my father had a ruptured ulcer. So the resident gave him a shot to relieve his pain, which was a, or, or they gave him a shot of adrenaline. Oh my God. And my father was sitting up, and, and that shot of adrenaline killed him because it just burst his heart. And he went back on the table and he was gone. From right from the shot? Right from Within the shot. Within seconds? Within seconds. Oh my God. Now my wife, my wife uh, and, and my sister Hilda are both pregnant at the same time and we had to go back. The sound that you hear there is Uncle Mickey getting up from his chair and he went into the kitchen and cried like a baby. All those years later. Just months after he made this tape, he passed away so we never got to do any more because of the way he felt he couldn't do any more that day, so that was the end of the tape.